Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's really unusual that you can see me because I'm so short that a couple of weeks ago, I'm just gonna drop, drop a name. A couple of weeks ago, I was reading with John Grisham and nobody saw me. <laughs> so, so I'm very grateful for this platform. I know it sounds insignificant to you, but it's a big deal <laughs> to be seen to be witnessed. So thank you for coming. Um, I am so honored and humbled to be a part of the Jagged Path exhibition and very, very um, appreciative to be requested to write this poem. I've never read this poem aloud to any public audience, so you are the guinea pig. Um, but I'm happy to read it for the first time. I've read it many times, but but not to a public audience, so thank you. Love notes for the jagged path. Holy places are dark places. It is life and strength, not knowledge and words that we get in them. Holy wisdom is not clear and thin like water, but thick and dark like blood, T.S. Eliot. Living history etches itself across a mountain's forehead. Deep in the sunken valley's fingers strum sacred steel, become requiem for a nameless mother's prayer. Proud feet ring shout whispers across jagged, tear-stained ground, anointing every crevice in every bend. They keep on coming. Braiding Carolina mountain paths with sweet grass, laurel, blue-eyed grass, flocks, Manara Didyama, singing hummingbirds home. Ancestral feathers dance with dragonflies, listen for the language of clicking tongues, naming home place. They keep on coming. They could not prevent the birds of sorrow from flying over their heads, but they refused to let them build nest in their hair. They measured their wingspan, scolding the wind for changing her course. Come along, little children. Follow the star behind the big white moon on the cold quilt. Wear winter shawl on the jagged path. Keep on coming. Blood memories locked inside face jugs, seeds carried in the hair. The old ones knew how to twist the wind's tail. Dead ones wail out to new seeds. Where is your ensikise? Wait for your inganga. Keep on coming, keep on coming, keep on coming. They keep on coming. Remembering that if they could have, they would have strangled them inside the bellies of their mamas. Angels were watching. Angels were counting. Angels were whispering, keep on coming. So they swam with the speckled trout from the depths of the mountain's bowels towards a light they could not name. The DNA of survival sewn inside their eyes Prayer stitched inside their palms. Mercy breeding inside their tongues. Keep on coming. Remembering the ones catching babies tossed back into the Atlantic. Remembering the ones staring down sharks following middle passage cargo. Remembering the ones chewing the lynching rope. Feasting on cornbread, rice, and beans Blessed slaughtered sustenance, scattering more seeds inside the journey. Keep on coming. They are the ones who keep on coming, becoming songs, poems, hallelujah dances, becoming all the colors their hearts could burst. They carried the jagged path inside the story of a life large enough to hold, large enough to bear, such a large journey. Keep on coming. Clenching black misery between their teeth, 
hiding black joy inside their wombs, unbecoming ancestral grief. They became their own who art in heaven, holding up the black universe. They became the hum inside the wasp nest. Keep on coming. They became the light streaming through cracked mornings. They unremembered all the stories told about them from bloody Sundays to sundown laws, from white lightning, fried pies, and stardust, muddy roads, tin roofs, and new money for brand new freedom. Keep on coming from pine trees, kudzu, honeysuckle vines, potato patches, hand-me-down blues, Saturday night jive, and a finger-sucking good Sunday sermon. Lifting, swaying, shifting, stretching, a jagged path into a new world, a new language, a new way of being in the world. They keep on coming. They were here 1619. They were here 1719. They were here 1819. They are here 1919. They are here 2019. They are here now. They keep on coming. The jagged path kisses the hems of their skirts, washes the soles of their feet, wipes the tears from their torn flesh, catches the blood of their sacrifice. The jagged path paints a rainbow above their scars for redemption of their lash, for the truths unstrung. They keep on coming bringing so much light. They keep on coming, dreaming the jagged path awake. Thank you. So this is how I roll. This is going to be a very uh, low-key, fun, I hope, evening. The work that I write is not fun. James Baldwin continues to instruct me that the artist, the writer, should write about and make art about the times that they live in. So my writing is not about seascapes, though I love seascapes and sunsets at the mountain, but it's really about the times that we live in. But I want to start with a statement. It matters what voices you listen to. It matters what books you read. It matters what you buy, what you do with your money if you have it, and how you interact with those who don't have it. It matters who you surround yourself with and why. It matters where you put your life labor. It matters where you put your love labor. It matters where you put your creative labor and what you create and why. It matters what you let into your life and what you are willing to live with. It matters what your relationship to the planet is or isn't. It matters how you respond to danger at the door, even if it's at your neighbor's door. So in these times, I'm reminded that there are so many neighbors in need. Um, and I'm also grieving um, the brutal slaying of, of two teenagers in my community who, whose bodies were found about a mile from my, my home, 14-year-old and 18-year-old. And because of their murders, there has been a backlash of a lot of racial tension that I'm really worried about the potential of violence. These are two children who just need to be buried. So when danger is at our neighbor's door, I require myself to pause. I require, require myself to be present to loss. So I'm going to read this piece for these two children. What do we tell the children? What do we tell the children about exploding ice cream trucks? blood-covered sliding boards, glass-infused snow cones. The child climbs to a window that collapses from the inside out, 
its glassy guts swallow her whole. What do we tell her brother who forgets her birthday, but remembers blue orbs that used to be her eyes falling from the sky? What do we tell the father, sifting rice from empty bowls, stealing carrots from the jaws of a squirrel? How do we tell the grandmother, who washes the graves between Fajr and Maghrib, that the dust is hungry and will eat the gloves from her hands? What do we tell the children when they ask you if the dead can hear them calling their names? What do we feed the mother whose mouth is stitched with grief? We draw a circle in the sand and stand. We draw a circle in the sand and stand. We draw a circle in the sand and stand. We whisper love into the sand. We whisper love into the sand. We whisper love into the sand. We teach the children how to draw circles in the sand. We teach the children how to draw circles in the sand. We teach the children how to draw circles in the sand. We teach the children how to stand in the circle. We teach the children how to stand in the circle. We teach the children how to stand in the circle. We stand in the circle with the children. We stand in the circle with the children. We stand in the circle with the children. We stay forever with the children in the circle. We stay forever with the children in the circle. We stay forever with the children in the circle. We whisper love over the heads of the children. We whisper love over the heads of the children. We whisper love over the heads of the children. The wind does not stir the sand. The wind does not stir the sand. The wind does not stir the sand. The ocean refuses to erase the circle. The ocean refuses to erase the circle. The ocean refuses to erase the circle. The children dream about moonbeams pouring from the sky. The mother remembers the taste of water. The father feeds squirrels from a full bowl. The grandmother turns dust into fire. So it's important for me to, to read that because um, I'm very concerned about our children. And as the poet laureate, I've taken this opportunity because I have the mic and I have it a lot to talk about this world that we live in that does not love some of us back, and especially our children right now. I believe that if, if people in power, people making decisions, would imagine every time they're casting a vote or opening their mouths, that they would imagine that there are children in the room. So we behave differently when children are in the room. So that's my, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. So I'm gonna start um, some poems. How many people know who Elizabeth Keckley was? Anybody, two people? Yeah, so Elizabeth Keckley was uh, Mary Todd Lincoln's, and if you don't know, that's Abraham Lincoln's widow. I, I mean, some of my Duke students did not know who Mary Todd Lincoln was, um, but that's not unusual. Elizabeth Keckley was Mary Todd Lincoln's seamstress or Mediste. And she lived in Hillsboro, in the county that I live in. Uh, she, was, she arrived in Hillsboro by way, and I always get this wrong, a Presbyterian or Episcopal clergy. I can never remember which one. But she definitely claimed with this clergy, she was the actual wedding gift to his wife, the clergy's wife and they landed in Hillsborough where he was over a church. They were very, very poor, as my grandmother would say. They were, they were as po as a rat's nest. So they hired Elizabeth Keckley out to the Bingham School for girls, a white private school in, in Hillsborough where she did what enslaved women do. She cooked, she cleaned, and she made clothing. Elizabeth Keckley was beaten quite often by Mr. Webb, 
the county attorney of that, that time. And I can take you to the space where, where he would beat her. She was a very uppity, considered a very insolent uppity uh, slave for which she was beaten. Years later, she is discovered by one of the senator's wives in Washington, D.C., who comes to Hillsboro and squires her away to make clothing for her in, in D.C. She later becomes um, Mary Todd Lincoln's seamstress. But what's fascinating is these two women were BFFs, they were best friends. They were not equals, but they were best friends. And their story is a very interesting story. Um, they both loved Abraham Lincoln and he loved both of them. And when he died, they both mourned him deeply. They also shared losing two babies around the same time. And I could tell you, I could go on and on and on about this relationship that was also very twisted in a lot of ways. Um, after Lincoln died, the widow was very, his widow were, were, was, was very poor and she crawled back to wherever she crawled out of, I forget where, Nebraska somewhere. And she was begging Elizabeth Keckley for money. Elizabeth Keckley at this time had become a very prosperous woman of color living in Washington, D.C. She's also one of the founders of Wilberforce University. But she lived in the upper class African American milieu in Washington, D.C. And she was constantly sending money to Mary Todd Lincoln until one day was like, girlfriend, get a job. I'm not sending you any more money. But they concocted the scheme to go to Europe where they would sell Lincoln's clothing because the American people would have not appreciated selling his clothing, especially the cloak that he was murdered in. And so the bees told them that it would be a very quiet, private transaction. But they lied and it became very, very public. Elizabeth Keckley was blamed for concocting the entire story. So I'm just gonna stop there, but I wanna read some poems. So a few years ago, this town of Hillsborough decided it was gonna have a celebration of Elizabeth Keckley, and I challenged them and said, and what are we celebrating? She was an enslaved woman in Hillsborough. We can call it a commemoration of her life in Hillsborough, but certainly it was not a celebration of her being in Hillsborough. So, uh, Another poet and I were requested by the Historical Association to, to do kind of a, a call and response between the voice of Mary Todd Lincoln and Elizabeth Keckley. And I'm gonna read three of the pieces. You don't have the other pieces, but I'm just gonna read three of the pieces from that collection. What daily things? Oh, Mary, dear noble woman, I've seen devils unleashed. When I was about seven years old, I witnessed for the first time the sale of a human being. We were living at Prince Edward in Virginia, and Master had just purchased his hogs for the winter, for which he was unable to pay in full. To escape from his embarrassment, it was necessary to sell one of his slaves. Little Joe, the son of the cook, was selected as the victim. His mother was ordered to dress him up in his Sunday clothes and send him to the house. He came in with a bright face, was placed in the scales, and was sold, like the hogs, at so much per pound. His mother was kept in ignorance of the transaction, but her suspicions were aroused. When her son started for Petersburg in the wagon, the truth began to draw upon her mind, and she pleaded piteously that her boy should not be taken from her. But Master quieted her, telling her that he was simply going to town with the wagon and would be back in the morning. Morning came, but little Joe did not return to his mother. Morning after morning passed, and the mother went down to the grave without ever seeing her child again. One day she was whipped for grieving for her lost boy. Colonel Burwell, 
never liked to see one of his slaves wear a sorrowful face, and those who offended in this particular way were always punished. O oh, Mary, dear noble mothers, I've seen such polite devils. Your dusty little heads are all accounted for. No need to count their shadows at play. Only God would find them irresistible enough to eat, saintly wolf. Sunday clothes are meant for Sunday things. Prayers and hymnals dance above the heads of your young cubs. A ride to town in the wagon means a warm bed hours later. A ride to town in the wagon means sweet dreams of licorice and clove-studded oranges. A ride to town is just a ride to town, protected, adored. Oh, Mary, dear noble sister, I've known mothers like you, dark, straight, fierce, with mama storm like you, but not enough storm for the devils that steal her babies. Not enough storm to chase away poisonous white man fever. Not enough storm to locate and bury their tiny bones. Not enough storm for the whip that counts her tears. Choosing. I've shown him things too. How to stare straight into the eyes of men holding forked deeds inside their hands and hearts. No one notices the dark shadows where he hides his fears, his clumsy hands. You and he become a dance of hope for the dark faces peeking, entering, serving your alabaster halls. I've known that pain before, a prick in my thumb, you dressing up for all the dances of his life. I too listen for the rush of your skirts in my hands, silver thread, a thousand porcelain buttons, crimson stitches inside a mouth full of worthiness. Testimony. Is it true what the wind brings to me? That modern women hold fancy parties in rooms where I was beaten? Are they waiting for the ghost of me to spill the wine, shred the facade of gentility, crawling in and out of rooms where my blood was afraid to drop? Is it true what the wind brings? My son died 1861 August. Your son died 1862 February. I wove a new dress of many pockets to hold my own grief. I rushed to stretch the door hinges of your heart that was closing. Is it true what the wind brings? My mother told me on her deathbed, Armistead Burwell is your real father. Is it true what the wind brings? Redeemed slave girl, kneeling before Abraham Lincoln. She forgot whose air she was breathing. She forgot the fragrance of mothers. She remembered the fragrance of baby's breath leaving her. Is it true what the wind brings? Raped, impregnated, beaten because I refuse to be beaten. White rapist, white executor. Later I chose a husband who could not spell, count, or dream in all the languages of lover, protector, provider. Is it true what the wind brings? Prayers belong to the weak. The currency of my tabooed elegance was a whole Bible worth drinking. White men take what they want, but never have enough hands to hold or carry all they've stolen. They carve belts out of the necks of my children and make me provide perfect, tight stitches. Is it true what the wind brings? You speak in the tones of hushed holiness. Your gloved hands hold up crushed heavens where strangers dare whisper your name. We are holding him together, 
small women of tremendous, tremendous sufferance. We hold a galaxy, a galaxy of wounded stars. Their only night light is a reflection of our tears after Gettysburg. Is it true what the wind brings? Our wombs hold memory, dead suns, stained dresses, stolen book bullets, crooked smiles, erased constitutions, bleeding flags. Is it true what the wind brings? So I guess y'all will say, okay, this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> History be like that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be nicer, I'll be a little gentler. For many years I have um, done residencies with women on death row in, in, in Raleigh. So for the reporters in the room, no, Jackie Shelton Green was never on death row. It was a writer in residence residency. And I say that because someone once wrote, I had no idea Jackie Shelton Green had once been on death row. <laughs> she wrote all these poems about her experience on death row. <laughs> so I, I worked with women on death row for, for a year where the only context, the only subject matter I allowed them to write from were their hands. They could only write about their hands. And I wanted them to think about the power of their hands. I wanted them to think about grace and I wanted to think, and, and their, their futures were very um, unpredictable. So how many of you remember, uh, what's her name? She probably doesn't want me to talk about her. The little old lady from Graham who killed all her husbands? Ms. Blanche. So Ms. Blanche was in my class. And I could never understand, because everyone else came in orange jumpsuits and every Monday night, Miss Blanche showed up and her, so I'm really gonna date myself, her Capizios and Papagallo loafers. There are some people in a room that remember Capizios and Papagallo loafers <laughs> and her pearls and those dainty little cardigan sets, you know, the little shale with the, with the cardigan and her pleated skirts and her matching tights that matched her Papagallos. And she was always well coiffed. And she always wore pink frosted lipstick. And I could never understand why, how she got to do that. And all the other women showed up in their orange jumpsuits. And she fascinated me and also scared the crap out of me. You know, because she was like, darling, I'm so happy you're back. It's Monday night. <laughs> so, um, there was a publication that, that came out of that because the women wrote wonderful poems about their hands. And we did a lot of visualization exercises because many of these women had been on death row for quite a while, had been incarcerated for quite a while. And I would ask them when was the last time they'd seen their, their, ch their children. And I remember one woman said, my daughter is now 17. The last time I saw her, she was three. And she came to visit and I've never, seen, I've never seen her again. Or my mom and my grandmother both have died while I've been incarcerated. So the, the visualizations were to imagine the last time, to reimagine the last time they brushed their daughter's hair, or to visualize holding their mother's or grandmother's hands. And because I'm the writer that teaches what I, I learn what I write, um, this is one of the poems in that collection. It's about my grandmother. I know the grandmother one had hands. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always in bowls, folding, pinching, rolling the dough, making the bread. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always underwater, sifting rice, bluing clothes, starching lives. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always in the earth, planting seeds, removing weeds, growing knives, burying sons. I know the grandmother one had hands, 
but they were always under the cloth, pushing it along, helping it birth into skirt, dress, curtains to lock out night. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always inside the hair, parting, plaiting, twisting it into rainbows. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always inside pockets, holding the knots, counting the twisted veins, holding on to herself, lest her hands disappear into sky. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always inside the clouds, poking holes for the rain to fall. So um, since I'm in this book, I'm going to read I'm going to read a, read a piece. Um, as a documentarian and, and as a, a documentary writer, I spend a lot of time working with primary and secondary sources. And I'm working on a, um, several books, but one of the books that I'm working on um, is about my, my father's family tree and also about my mother's family tree. So I'm going to read a poem and a, a little bit about a lynching of, the, of my great uncle. But I'm going to read this piece because it's about a primary source, a photograph that sat on my grandmother's piano my entire childhood and in my 20s when she died. No one would ever talk about this photograph. And when she died, we were all, so how many of you grew up where you know you had that room you only went into, that parlor? You went in Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, Mother's Day. Somebody died. Those are the only times she went into the living room. But we were all in the living room, and I looked at my uncle, and I said, okay, he was a white dude on the piano. He said, oh, that would be your great-grandfather. So I've embellished this, this poem a little bit, but I'm, but I'm going to read it, because I keep going down these rabbit, these ancestral rabbit holes. Segregated rainbows, one. 1932, somewhere over the South Carolina border, a yellow dress becomes canvas, witness to colorless dreams that appear beneath my grandmother's smile. Standing together under protective moonless, starless sky, blonde and black hair touching, daring the air, daring oceans between them. My grandparents clasp hands, stare into the invisible lens of an invisible camera. They stare straight ahead into an erect future, cross burnings slash tires, backyard clotheslines torched, dead cats hurled through windows. Two, 1953, I am born, granddaughter, the color of coral, ripen peaches, brown hair that rolls up into little rivers. I enter this world carrying grandmother's birthmark, the same arrow pointing east inside my, her, left thigh. I grow my father's smile when I cry. I grow the gray stone wolf eyes of grandfather. When I was seven, my tears teach me grandfather's language. Three, I grow into the arrow inside my left thigh. I grow hair, breast for the wind's daughter. I grow hips, teeth for the moon's wife. Four, I become the yellow dress, patched, blood-stained, hidden. I become the ground somewhere over the South Carolina border, receiving their dance, their prayer. I become blonde, black hair, bleeding together. I become their hands, loving in and out of season. I become their land, fertilized by miscarried, aborted ashes. I am the life they could not birth, they could not name, nor call home. Five, my grandmother teaches me other languages, archery, piano, ballet, seduction, rivalry. My mother teaches me to be her, 
not to become the arrow inside my left thigh. She demands that I cease walking, talking with wolves. Six, grandfather's obituary did not mention my grandmother as his wife, my mother as his daughter, my uncle as his son. The wrinkled, worn news clipping chronicles and keeps the evidence of your memories. The smell of antique leather, expensive cigars, expensive smiles, collections of leather-bound books, photo albums, bank portfolios. Seven, I am the crying wolf, warrior without tribe. My inkwell spills dust-coated ink meant for a hidden canvas, moth-eaten, evicting shadows of another likeness, another moth-eaten revenge. Eight, I become sword of the grandfather, become another trophy, memory, Persian rooms, afternoons of tea biscuits, polite assassinations, sexual innuendos, piano recitals, lullabies, waltz, and proper chairs. I am the granddaughter, witness to the incest of rain and snow, witness to this betrayal of rainbows. Nine, we bury yellow dresses, deeds, birth certificates. We bury swords, teeth, segregated deaths. We bury questions, reprisals, birth rights. 10. Every morning, the wolf visits my yard, and I remember to feed him. So, what am I doing for time? Uh, 647. 40 minutes. Oh, I thought you said I could go on. I was like, these people don't want me to go on for 40 minutes. <laughs> Have you lost it? Um, so I, I want to read um, The Communion of White Dresses, uh, which, is, which is going to be a collection. I have this obsession with white linen, and especially antique white linen and white lace. And... Um, this piece has been choreographed and actually was accepted into, I didn't even know there was such a thing, into the San Francisco Poetry, no, Dance Poetry Festival. Um, and the entire The River Speaks of Thirst album. And so there's a video produced by um, the, Justice, the, the Justice Theater Project in Raleigh. So in collaboration with um, the Raleigh Choral Ensemble and a bunch of people whose names I've forgotten and the dance department at NCCU, it's a fabulous uh, video if you want to check it out. It's, it's The River Speaks of Thirst. It's a video that you can just pull down on, on YouTube. But um, this piece, The Communion of White Dresses, is, uh, I just want to read it. The Communion of White Dresses. In my dreams, I am all the women in generations of white dresses, white Sundays that cover altars in all the hushed seams of white linen. White gloves lift, pour, sift, whispered prayers across crystal cups. Blood becomes bread. I learn to lift white dresses over my head careful not to disturb the pleats that will soon be crushed by hungry hands. What is the difference between standing, pouring blood down the throats of phantom believers, and kneeling before the parched lips of a nameless lover? White dresses bear secrets in the neckline, along hem stitches. White dresses remember the language of hands lifting, stretching, folding them into, a, into the froth of a cloud forest. I am the shadow of all the white dresses hidden. I am the ghost of all the white dresses, remembering the stretch of a daughter's shroud, the dance of another daughter's wedding veil. I am the tears that hold the needle steady 
while grandmothers stitch a Rapunzel of sky. I am breath that is caught in the fragrance of a mother's hair. White communion dresses weighed in the holiness of a forced faith that does not rhyme with my name. I become red, fierce, bloody ocean, swallowing a procession of white dresses at dawn. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. Come dance in the cloud forest. Come dress the nymphs in your long, silky strands. Come lift the skirts of thirsty virgins. Stand beneath the altar to catch all the white dresses that they are casting into the wind. My shoulders sigh under the reluctance of stiff, coarse white dresses, woven with shards of prisms so tight the waist becomes a prison. I want to undress my Sunday body for slow, patient redressing of Saturday night black lace, black sweat, a black promise to erase this white stain. White dresses become harsh smears, confessional cages. White dresses on my skin remind me of the unraveling of crows hiding in the elderberry tree, hiding all things shiny, all things unborn to a womb of ink. This is the tightness inside the throat of a white dress that pulls stitches tighter, that threaten mutiny. I am the night walker in white. I am the song of the legend of the woman in the white cloud forest, who is known to eat the lace from her sleeves, her collars, her buttons. White dresses become succor for a timeless famine. White dresses, white doves, white stones, white crosses, white veils. I am the one chosen to commit, conceal, execute, reveal, undress the sorcery, betrayal, acquisition, acquittal, the dowry of white dresses, the violence of white dresses. Cover me tenderly. So, I don't want to end on a particular poem because I I really don't like leaving certain energy in spaces. Um, but <clears throat> most of my poetry comes out of story. It is all contained inside of story. Um, and it spans multiple times, periods, and landscapes, as well as teasing those boundaries in between liminal spaces and existing and non-existing uh, realities. Uh, so I, wanna, I wanna read a piece. Um, I actually wanna read three more pieces. But you all tell me if you're like, you need to just stop. So I'm gonna read this piece um, that was published a long time ago in, a, in another journal. I need some water to read it. <laughs> So I was once at a poetry reading where I was accused of, you bring us no hope. <laughs> you keep right reading and writing these dark things. <laughs> Can I take you to Starbucks later, dude? <laughs> Waiting for love. You gotta really pay attention because it's, it's dense. Waiting for love. Alone, cold mint tea in orange plastic torn jalaba. A red you forbid, waiting, drowning in six too many capsules of magic. Trying to remember the words of the astrologer or what you were screaming as you fled into the secret clay wall of your brother's house. Trying to understand that I am only allowed to pray on Wednesdays. Pray only in the blue mosque in Mazar e Sharif, or join your sisters at Karte e Shake. 
this strange but magical cobble. My captor, cobble. The first time I drank the darkness of a particular Pashtun male. The morning I am face to face with Malaya, the only female police in Kandahar. We play burqa eye games before she slaps me, shouting to lower my gaze, cover my hen at wrist, or wake up dead. I return to these walls I name home, to the sacred stitches and colors, rugs from your tribe, my dowry, my art. I smoke the ancient hashish I found buried beneath the kitchen wall tiles that your youngest sister, Salah, provides. She tells me it belonged to your grandmother. We smoke, sleep, cry, eat the feta, olives, grapes, and dream of weddings, hair, beaches, nail polish, dark warriors bearing Tibetan music. We arrive by caravan to the wedding. Your father tells me you will come. So I search for you amongst the men that encircle the wedding party and begin wishing that I could place a hidden camera in the back of my burqa so I can see you when you remain invisible. I am the foreign woman, laughing undetected beneath my blue wedding tent, a gift from your mother, reminding me that this is the way for a refugee wife. Suddenly, I smell the secret blend of wedding oils against my face. It is Zara, your sister, laughing far too openly amongst men, hugging, thanking me for her happiness, not understanding the smile in her eyes. I do not feel my body shift or her left hand seize the gun from my pocket. Zara, my sister-in-law, forced to marry the man with green teeth, shoots her head off during the beginning of the week-long Eid e Gabon, trying to forget. All I am forced to remember, razor wire nights, coochie boys wearing desert faces, speaking to me in all the languages of hunger, begging for gold thread. I don't remember the name of the particular dark Pashtun male or the color of Zara's wedding dress. I try to forget her smile, the way blood creates its own art, spraying the cake, the gifts of sugar, bread, honey, spices, prayer carpets, scarves from your sister. I remember your daily screams when I forgot and opened the door to visitors in Peshawar, forgetting always to wear my chadar. I remind you that I am the same woman who raced barefoot, escaping the war rapes of 60 Russians behind a hill in Wazir Akbu Khan. I am the woman you danced with beneath the stars in Kandahar, the same astrologer who meets your eyes in the bazaar. I am every woman in the snow-covered streets of Ghazni or in Herat, Provence, lighting candles in search of Zara's gold teeth. I am the lost bullet, lodged in the wedding cake that the man with green teeth serves to his new bride, Fatima. I will meet her in the bathroom stalls next door to the blue mosque and pretend I do not see her tap my market basket, remove the muslin cloth, covering the fresh chicken, dates, onions, potatoes, lemons, drop my knife into the deep pockets of her riding skirts. Our smiles whispering, assalamu alaikum. It is the coldest night without you, and I am preparing a dinner for your return. The foods of our passionate longings, lentil and bulgur, patties, stuffed eggplant, kasiri cheese my brother smuggles from Turkey, chicken pilaf, raisin compote. I spend hours shaving, oiling my skin, soaking in frankincense, ginger, jasmine water. Arrange rose petals throughout our bed. Sharpen candlesticks that will light this night. There is no more hash, guns, or knives. 
only the wedding feast waiting. So I think I'm going to end there. And uh, are we good? Um, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Mm, nope. <laughs> I often say that the right that the poem writes me, if that makes any sense to you. Um, I often tell people that so my writing process has a lot, sometimes has a lot to do with journaling. So this book comes from about thirteen journals that I. Um, had just been keeping for years, not that many years, maybe three years, 13 different journals. And uh, I use my journals like bank accounts. So how do we use our bank account? Deposits and withdrawals. So tonight, like there are three lines rolling around in my head now just from that I'm inspired from looking at some of you, but I don't have time to write that poem. So those three words or lines get deposited. So I went to Central America with those 13 journals, and I came back with this manuscript. Because all of those little deposits of one-liners, three-liners, one paragraph, or one page, they started to have some symmetry and conversation. They were in dialogue in ways that I did not know. Journals that I had forgotten I'd even written in. So um, that's one of my processes, and then um, sometimes I'm just very intentional about writing. I, I didn't read um, the poem that I was going to read, which is, it's about the lynching of my great uncle, my, my grandfather, my great grandfather and my great uncle were the first black sheriffs in Alamance County after Reconstruction. And the story is, and this is historical record, uh, they arrested a white woman downtown Burlington for public drunkenness. That night they were dragged out of their homes, and they both were lynched. But my grandfather, my great-grandfather, I keep saying grandfather, my great-grandfather survived. He survived because someone got to him before he died, and they hid him and nursed him back. We know he survived because there is public record that in the 1800s, he traveled to Washington, D.C., and testified at an anti-Klan activity hearing. Um, that, that particular poem comes from my obsession with finding um, one where the actual lynching happened and two, the burial place. Um, and, and, and doing a lot of research around the plantation, very famous plantation in Alamance County. Um, so a lot of the work is very intentional. When I'm, I go down a lot of rabbit hole, research rabbit holes. Thank you. Any other questions? So y'all understood absolutely everything I read. <laughs> Everybody know what bluing was? There is a line. Bluing souls. We're the southern folk in the room. Bluing was that stuff, because that's what I called it as a little girl. The blue that people put into their white wash, bluing. Remember that? So as a child, I was fascinated with the blue liquid that went into the final rinse because it fascinated me that it did not turn the clothes blue. They came out pristine white. That metaphor has, has just, just like a, it's a, it's a wonderful metaphor. And I, I, I love working with metaphors. So bluing, so that's why I said y'all understood everything I read. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> Anywho, um, yeah, so just wanted to ask you if you knew what it meant. Anything else? Yes? Your 
It's been posed to me. It just hasn't happened. Um, I have CDs. Yeah, I have a CD. Um, I even have an LP because I'm obsessed with vinyl. And I was working with two really cool rock, rock band engineers who was like, yeah, we're going to have vinyl. I was like, I'm all for it. Doesn't sell that much because most people don't have a record player. <laughs> but, um, but I wanted vinyl. So maybe. Someone else had a hand up? Yes. Um, when I was young, but the question should be when I knew what I was doing. <laughs> so as a child, I wrote lots of little stories on little strips of paper and put them in glass jars and buried them. Uh, I wanted them to be secrets, my secret stories in little glass jars. But I really... Um, I really leaned into my writing in high school. Um, was kicked out of public schools in North Carolina during the advent of desegregation in North Carolina in the 60s, and I landed in a Quaker boarding private school in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and I just really, really leaned into, into my craft and writing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much.